Our first talk of the afternoon is Ben Hoyer speaking on Eadic non abelian housekeeping and environments. Thank you very much. So, uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, tell you something about uh, some recent work on Piadic non abelian Hodge theory, in particular um, about something called the Piadic Simpson correspondence. And uh, now, uh, this topic, something that uh, Bagaf already talked about for those of you who were in New York on Thursday. Um, but so, this talk is uh, perhaps about something slightly different, namely, the goal of this talk, what I want to get to, is uh, I want to explain how uh, this correspondence called the Piatic Simpson correspondence can be interpreted or upgraded to a statement, a geometric statement about moduli spaces. Okay, uh, but by way of motivation, we should start, we should start out. Um, <laughs> by seeing uh, what our colleagues in complex geometry can prove. I want to start <coughs> with complex non abelian Hodge theory. So <coughs> we put ourselves in the geometric setup of uh, complex Hodge theory. So we take a compact Keller manifold. And uh, fix the base point. And <coughs> so the way that I like to think about uh, the subject is that, at least as a starting point, it is about understanding the category of representations of uh, the topological fundamental group uh, of this manifold, hence the choice of base point. And so perhaps the first thing one can look at are some of the additive characters of this topological fundamental group. And these are described by uh, the Hodge decomposition. Like this, a so singular cohomology on the one hand, and then Hodge cohomology on the other side. And the statement is that, so maybe the starting point of non abelian Hodge theory, that this has what one can, first of all, vaguely describe, and I will say more precisely what I mean by this after stating the theorem, namely, this has a categorical non abelian generalization. And this is a theorem of, well, somehow, I mean, this is a long history, but perhaps the last two parts are provided by Kevin Collette and Carlos Simpson, hence the name Collette-Simpson correspondence. This is from a paper of Simpson in 92. And it says that there's an equivalence of categories between this category that uh, we want to understand, namely representations of the topological fundamental group of X uh, on finite dimensional C vector spaces or C local systems, if you like, on the one hand, on, on the other hand, there's a category of Higgs bundles on X. Okay, uh, satisfying some conditions. I, I will write them later, but I first want to explain what Higgs bundle is. So this is some coherent uh, datum, if you want. <clears throat> Namely, a Higgs bundle is a pair E theta consisting of so a holomorphic vector bundle on X in particular, maybe if we want to think about this in a more algebraic setting where X is a um, smooth projective variety, then this would be an algebraic vector bundle. And then theta is what's called a Higgs field. So this is uh, an OX linear morphism of this form, so not a uh, connection, but rather it's OX linear. And then there's some condition, some commutativity condition, which is usually usually phrased in this way. But like 
this is maybe the quickest way to write it down, but it, that's almost never the condition I actually use. So let me write down something that's perhaps more useful in practice. So, so equivalently, so this, this last commutativity condition, what this means is that, so if you, if you dualize this thing, which you can because it's OX linear, then, so, can make sense of it as a morphism from the dual of the differentials into the uh, endomorphisms of the vector bundle. And then the condition, this commutativity condition says that this extends to the symmetric algebra. So uh, equivalent, this is the datum of an OX algebra homomorphism uh, of this form. So that's how I like to think about uh, the Higgs field. And then I call this theta as well. Okay, so this is the kind of data we have uh, on the other side, the kind of Hodge theoretic description of this category of representations. Uh, but there's some uh, conditions here, namely first, the Higgs bundle has to be semi-stable. And then there's a topological condition, which is uh, just a condition on the underlying vector bundle, namely that there are vanishing rational turn classes. Okay, but maybe, so <clears throat> in first approximation, one can think of this as a fully faithful functor from representation into the category of Higgs bundles, and then one can somehow describe the essential image of this functor. <clears throat> okay, so in, in what sense is this a categorical non-abelian generalization? So there's several uh, ways to think about this. The first one, <coughs> which is um, somehow how, how this is usually explained uh, in expositions on this, this topic in complex geometry is that you, you can think of <clears throat> of this side here somehow as being, if you pass through isomorphism classes of objects, then th the set that you get is uh, the, this cohomology group with coefficients in the GLN of C. And if you pass through isomorphism classes here, then like if you just blindly replace the structure sheaf by GLN here, then you get a vector bundle. And then there's also the datum of, of a differential. So in this sense, this is somehow supposed to be like to, to, to look like this Hodge decomposition there. Uh, but okay, so this is very, very vague. One can make this more precise. For example, uh, one can just leverage the Tanakian formalism to see that there's a generalization um, of both sides uh, for any linear algebraic group where we would consider representations uh, in a group G on this side, and then what's called a G Higgs bundle on this side. So there's some underlying G torso, et cetera. And if I do this for the group GA and pass through isomorphism classes, then I recover precisely this uh, decomposition up there. So that's, that's maybe one more precise way of saying this. And then another one that I want to mention. So this time I'll actually write it down. So if I take a, a representation, let's say okay, like this, call it row, and uh, consider the associated C local system. Then there's a canonical comparison of cohomology, namely the singular cohomology with coefficients in this local system can be canonically identified with, so there's a natural notion of cohomology for Higgs bundles, and this is called a Dolbeau cohomology. And this is identified with a Dolbeau cohomology of the Higgs bundle associated to this local system under this colored Simpson uh, correspondence. And if I, Uh, look at what this says in the case of the trivial representation, then this side here is singular cohomology, whereas if I evaluate this Dolbeau cohomology, uh, so this, this will go to the trivial Higgs bundle, and if I evaluate Dolbeau cohomology on that, then I will precisely get uh, the Hodge decomposition. In fact, also in higher cohomological degree, right? So, so this tells me that somehow there's really a generalization also of the higher uh, cohomological pieces of the Hodge uh, decomposition. Okay, and then uh, lastly, okay, so how do I do this now? I see. Whoops. Um, one second while I figure this out, okay. Okay, 
okay, now maybe in the wrong order, but. So this can be upgraded. So this was now all about, uh, this is all in, in the first um, paper of Simpson on this topic. And then in the second one, maybe he uh, explained how to upgrade these uh, two statements about moduli spaces. And there's something quite subtle happens, namely, so the correspondence, so first of all, there are moduli spaces, uh, natural moduli spaces of objects on both sides. And the correspondence induces a homeomorphism between these moduli spaces. So one of these is called the Betty moduli space. And okay, so actually there's several things I could mean by this. Maybe it's best uh, to impose some condition like that. Uh, this is uh, parameterizing irreducible representation so that I actually get a nice uh, complex analytic variety. And then on the other hand, there's a moduli space of Higgs bundles where I also impose some further conditions to get nice geometric objects. And then the statement is that I get a homeomorphism, uh, like the, the, the correspondence if I pass to isomorphism classes induces a homeomorphism between these things, but there's a catch. This turns out to be, even though both sides have complex analytic structures, this homeomorphism is not complex analytic. And one can see this already from the case of line bundles. One worked out what precisely what the formulas are. <coughs> and so in fact, also the construction of this correspondence, the Colette Simpson correspondence is really something which is somehow real analytic in nature. And this thing turns out to be real analytic, but this is not complex analytic. Okay. Yes, so I, I, I was uh, intentionally vague here. I mean, you can either, I don't know, <laughs> you can still write on topological spaces, uh, uh, somehow that you can say are uh, moduli spaces for the whole categories, but it's probably better to impose some uh, regularity conditions on those sides to consider irre uh, irreducible representations to make these nice uh, uh, complex analytic varieties. Yes, okay. Uh, so that's uh, everything I wanted to say about complex on MB and Hodge theory. And now as a periodic geometer, when I look at these beautiful results and what I see is a wish list, right? So I want uh, analogs of all of these results uh, in the periodic world. And that is going to be uh, the goal of this talk to explain how all of these statements which are on the board now um, have analogs in periodic analytic uh, geometry. Okay. So let's maybe continue here. So this brings me to the first part of the title, namely periodic non-abelian Hodge theory. So we take C to be a complete algebraically closed extension of QP. maybe just uh, the completion of an algebraic closure of QP, but there's a good reason why it's better to actually work in this more general setup. And we take, so there's no analog in the, of the Keller condition somehow in the periodic world, so we just take any smooth proper rigid space. Over C, and uh, let's maybe fix the base point as well. And uh, okay, I will, regard this as an attic space. <laughs> and the goal will be to, at least the starting point, is the goal to understand all representations of the, what's the analog of the topological fundamental group uh, of the complex numbers. Here we have the etal fundamental group. And we want to understand representations of this on finite dimensional C vector spaces. But there's already a difference at this stage, namely this is now a profinite group, in particular a topological group, and the topology interacts in a non-trivial way with the topology on C. So I should ask for these representations to be continuous. Okay, and then 
Mm -hmm. So as the first step, of course, uh, we should convince ourselves that there's a, before we do anything non-abelian, there's an analog of the abelian theory, and this is given by uh, the Hodge state. Short exact sequence. So this is due to the work of many people, I should at least put five things, and then maybe 2G, and then I guess in this setting, it's been proven 12 years ago, so by Scholze. Uh, and this says that, so there's a short exact sequence Mm, I still fit this here. Okay. Comparing the etal cohomology, which is now our analog of singular cohomology. Uh, to Hodge cohomology. <coughs> but it's not a priori. Uh, an isomorphism of this with a direct sum of these paths, but it's rather uh, a short exact sequence. So in other words, this is not canonically split. And, okay. Mm, so two things to point out here is that once again, I can con interpret this middle term here as uh, some of the additive continuous characters of uh, additive characters of the fundamental group, so that's good. So, so that's somehow matches with uh, this uh, sort of abelian theory of a C. And then, okay, there's a tail twist here, the minus one. And uh, okay, so this tail twist should be everywhere in the talk, in particular in the definition of fixed bundles, but I'll just choose some roots of unities uh, to ignore this. So from now on, I just suppress all tail twists. That's harmless because uh, I don't want to discuss color actions today. Okay, and then there's, there's a second part, namely so the choice of a lift of x to one of these from 10 period rings, namely B2. We run plus mu t squared. Uh, induces the splitting. So in other words, I can think of this still as being a, a decomposition, like in the complex theory, but I need an additional datum. And maybe if I'm in an arithmetic situation where X has a model over some discretely valued field, then uh, there's a canonical lift uh, I can work with, so that's maybe not uh, too bad. Pardon? Oh, yes, sorry, yes. So it, it, such a lift always exists. So this is somehow maybe a harmless additional datum, but it is an additional datum uh, to keep into account. So in particular, this tells us that uh, we can't, if we work in this completely general setup, uh, expect to have a completely canonical uh, analog of the statement we have there. Okay, there's one more thing we need to observe or we need to think about before we can get to uh, the periodic analog of the college Simpson correspondence. And that's <coughs> um, that we should shift attention from representations to a different category of generalized representations. And that's uh, the following lemma. So there's a fully faithful embedding of uh, this category. Okay, so this is the category I want to later describe of continuous representations of the fundamental group. On finite dimensional C vector spaces into the category of V vector bundles. So 
So what is this? So this is, by definition, the category of finite locally free sheaves on the V side, maybe of the diamond uh, associated to X. This one of these fine, very fine locally perfectoid uh, topologies defined by Scholze. So let's see. This one. And for the purpose of this talk, maybe it doesn't matter so much uh, what exactly this is. And, uh, but I should mention that this is the same as the category of vector bundles in the pro side. side. With the completed structure sheaf. So this is what, uh, for those who were in New York, what Bagger worked with. Uh, these two categories are uh, equivalent. The theorem of Kitlaya Liu. And uh, okay, but especially if you later want to get to the moduli stacks, there's uh, a good reason why it's better to work in, in this category here, yeah? where we have somehow more, more I know, th things to, uh, to a larger category to, to build uh, things with. And also, so Faltings actually had a way to describe this category before there was the pro etale site and before there were perfectoid spaces. And I don't want to give the definition, but Faltings had a category of generalized representations. And one can now see that these are precisely uh, equivalent to this category of v-vector bundles. And I mean, maybe this also, this lemma also explains why they are called generalized representations. It's a large category that continuous representations of the fundamental group uh, embed into. <clears throat> and okay, so how, how does this work? It's actually very, very, very easy to describe. So maybe we take a representation of the fundamental group, some finite dimensional c-vector space, and we send this to the following thing. So this is now describing the functor. So we interpret this representation as a descent datum for a vector bundle for a certain cover, namely the universal cover of X. And this is defined as uh, the inverse limit of all connected finite etale covers of X together with the lift of the base point. So this runs over all connected finite et al. Covers of X. Did I again forget to, I always forget to assume that X is connected. I apologize. <laughs> connected. Sorry. Okay, otherwise this maybe doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is just a, um, Purely formally the inverse limit, I can form this, for example, in the category of diamonds. And uh, it is built in such a way that the projection to X is precisely a torsor in the V topology uh, under this fundamental group here. So it somehow has the same geometric properties as uh, the, uni uh, the universal cover, the topological universal cover in complex uh, geometry. In particular, I can think of this as being similar to the first step um, in the definition of this Colette Simpson functor, which is the Riemann Hilbert correspondence, sending a representation to a vector bundle with a flat connection. I'm not saying that this is a periodic Riemann Hilbert correspondence, yeah, but in this vague sense, it's, it's analogous. Okay, so we can now somehow redefine what we are doing here. So a priori, we wanted to study the, the category of continuous representations of the prioritized fundamental group, but I now want to sort of uh, define the title. So maybe let's do this here. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, periodic non imbrian Hodge theory uh, is the study of V-vector bundles. So we are doing V-bundology or something. Uh, okay. So the goal is now to describe this category uh, there. And then in the second step, maybe you do something about the category of continuous representations. Okay, and uh, 
That being said, now that we've conveniently redefined the goal, uh, I can <coughs> state the main theorem of the first part. Uh, but for this, I should maybe make some space here. Okay, I mean, I, you see that I live over a perfectoid field. So, I mean, maybe I'm slightly imprecise when I say what the structure sheet here is, but you can say that somehow I fix an untilt, right? Because I have fixed C. So I can, uh, I mean this perfect to be perfectoid spaces and characteristic zero. Okay, so I mean, if you like, you can just take this to be the category of perfectoid spaces living over X. Right. <clears throat> okay, so we can now formulate uh, the periodic analog of this Colette Simpson correspondence. And this is, okay, so based on the work of many people, I should um, at least mention uh, Falting, who proved this for curves some uh, 20 years ago. And then in the way uh, I want to formulate it here, it's <coughs> uh, an article of mine from eight months ago or something. Okay, and we first need to make some choices. We need to choose the lift x of x uh, to be two. So exactly like uh, we need for the splitting of dodge decomposition. And then there's a second datum, which is the choice of an exponential. And, okay, so this is a function which should be of this form, and it should be linear and continuous, and I actually have a little bit of room to, uh, for, for the definition, but, uh, so this should definitely be a splitting of the periodic logarithm, which is defined on, on this open disk here, and then maybe to get some compatibilities, it would be better to also ask that uh, on the convergence radius of the periodic exponential, so some, some um, open disk uh, around zero, it, uh, yeah, it extends the, the usual periodic exponential. But uh, in fact, this is actually not required. But uh, yeah, for, for compatibilities, it's, it's better to do this. Okay, so that, that's, that's a weird datum. Yeah? More about this later. Okay, but these choices uh, induce an exact tensor equivalence, so an equivalence of categories um, preserving various structures. Between, mm -hmm. perhaps, the category of v-vector bundles on X. And the category of all Higgs bundles on X. Okay, so <clears throat> this uh, achieves this uh, goal of this uh, subject of uh, V-bundology, but uh, maybe I can ask, okay, so how do the representations fit into the picture now? And so by way of this lemma, I can now embed the representations of X fully faithfully into this category. And they will be sent to some category of Higgs bundles. So this will go to some fully faithful, some sorry, full subcategory Higgs bundles. And then there will be some condition. Uh, characterizing the essential image uh, of the representations. And, okay, I say more about this later, but we don't know what the two question marks are, and we know that the answer will be difficult. Okay, but this somehow explains the relation uh, to the Collette Simpson correspondence, okay, because if I have such um, an equivalence here, then uh, I in particular obtain this functor, at least this fully faithful functor from continuous representations. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I mean, 
Feed vector bundles are now something which arises in, in many different contexts uh, in, in periodic arithmetic geometry where they are not necessarily related to continuous representation. So I guess they are now um, objects of independent interest. Mm. Okay, so this is also often called, I think, Faltings introduced this name, uh, the Piadic Simpson correspondence, yeah, because of this uh, uh, analogy to the Colette Simpson correspondence. And maybe it should rather be called Piadic Colette Simpson correspondence, but okay, I think the name has stuck now, uh, or uh, Piadic non abelian Hodge correspondence. Right, okay. So one source is that uh, I could have, for example, um, a QP local system, uh, which does not admit a ZP lattice. Yeah, for example, I mean, <laughs> again, for, for those who are in New York, Bagaf Pak gave in some details, uh, an example uh, coming from uh, yeah, the lubin tate space, for example, where one can uh, see that there's no ZP lattice, I think then because it's not associated to a, a representation, but, uh, I mean, for example, <coughs> mm, there's a notion of degrees uh, on B vector bundles. For example, if I start with a line bundle, and if I come from a representation, then this will always have degree zero. So any other degree is automatically something. I mean, for example, just take uh, an Ital bundle, <laughs> which is of, uh, of degree one, or something like this. This will not come from a representation. It's just cheating, perhaps. But. Okay, so <coughs> now, there's uh, a few things I should say um, about this theorem before going on. <clears throat> so first of all, there's also, so this was in the proper case. There's also, there's other instances of periodic Simpson correspondences, uh, which don't assume this properness, but then one has to impose further conditions on both sides. Namely, one has deals with small V vector bundles and small Higgs bundles. And this is somehow <clears throat> um, maybe the correspondence, which is uh, people, have, people have studied more in the meantime, in particular, uh, in the work of Abes Gro or Liu Zhu or uh, Tsuji, Dening Averna. And <clears throat> somehow in Falting's approach to this equivalence, the idea is that uh, one first proves somehow a local statement relating small um, objects on both sides. And then there's uh, a descent step where in, in the proper case, one deduces the general case from the small one. Um, but so I want to, explain a little bit, at least in, in a few bullet points, my approach in which uh, this is really a global construction, which does not go through this local theory. And so I would advocate to really see this as somehow two independent statements. There's like the, the local uh, case and there's the global case. And this is the global case of the correspondence. Okay, and <clears throat> so two more things about this. First of all, so this lift here, so, so the, in contrast to the, the complex correspondence, this is not canonical. Yeah? There's, there's these two choices. And this lift here, I can live with that. That's fine, right? I mean, this is nicely explained by the Hodge decomposition in arithmetic situations. There's a canonical one anyway, doesn't matter. This exponential here is weird. Yeah, there's, this is non-canonical. This is not, this doesn't look like a geometric thing uh, I, I would have, um, or it's, it's something that is not stable under extensions of C. I need to choose a new exponential if I extend C, et cetera. And, um, So to define the exponential, yeah, I guess maybe, I mean, it's easy to see that an exponential exists, but to actually find one, I guess it's maybe a bit awkward. Uh, right, and then there's actually a second layer of choices, um, which I didn't uh, write anything about, namely, even if I make these choices, then it's not natural. So if I take another space Y and I want to contain, compare how like these two categories um, behave under pullback, then in general, it's, uh, well, <laughs> just impossible to say uh, how, um, to, to, to relate these things, namely <clears throat> more precisely, if I make, for example, so there's, there's a layer of, of choices of, of base points. And if I make different choices of base points and the two equivalences are uh, like, there's a natural transformation between them, but not a canonical one. So in particular, I can't actually, this is not compatible with descent on both sides. So this is, this is something very subtle. And this is not just somehow uh, our collective failure in the field that we can't construct this, but like all these choices and the lack of naturality, they are features of the situation. It's just something that such an equivalence will always satisfy. If you give me a periodic Simpson correspondence, I can give you the exponential that you used uh, in the process. And, and yeah, the naturality also, the, the lack of naturality also has somehow um, 
some kind of meaning. Okay, and so this is uh, one motivation to try to formulate this correspondence in terms of moduli spaces and find some a geometric explanation for what these choices here do. Okay, so this is somehow uh, the goal of this talk. Um, okay, but be before we do this, just one more thing from the complex theory that we should talk about, namely the cohomological comparison. So let me swap the boards here. So this is was part one of the theorem, and now part two is the cohomological comparison, namely that says that for any v-vector bundle, uh, v on x, uh, there is, and this time we finally, we have a canonical isomorphism or, or quasi-isomorphism between uh, the v-cohomology of this bundle and the Dolbo cohomology of the associated Higgs bundle. And once again, if I take the trivial bundle here, then this will go to the trivial Higgs bundle and I recover on the one hand via the primitive comparison theorem, uh, etal cohomology, and on the other hand, uh, Hodge cohomology. So once again, this generalizes the Hodge decomposition also in higher cohomological degrees. Okay, and then, as I already, uh, mentioned so the open it, it's it's currently not known what the essential image of representations is yeah so uh, we can't even formulate a conjecture in general but if we are slightly more careful namely if we uh, let the, the base pair field be cp and if moreover x is projective then it at least seems sensible to ask if it's true that like in the complex world, I'm allowed to describe the essential image as those Higgs bundles which are semi-stable with vanishing churn classes, vanishing rational churn classes. And at least in this case, so there's some evidence for this. Namely, we know this in the case that X is an epiloid variety or for the rank one object uh, on both sides as well. So these are like a billion cases. And this is a joint work with Lukas Mann and Annette Werner from last year, I guess. Okay, uh, but in fact, one also knows that, so if I, for example, take an abeloid variety over a larger field, then uh, this description becomes wrong and the essential image is strictly smaller. Uh, so in particular, so this will not be the correct uh, description in general? Well, I, I assume that it's projective. I mean, maybe. Uh, well, I mean, let's fix maybe a projective embedding or something. So I, I think this is, this is not, in the end, it, I think, yes, yes, it should be uh, uh, independent. Sorry, what? <laughs> ah. No, uh, slope stability, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right, okay, but I mean, th this is somehow as a warning that one has to be careful uh, how to formulate a conjecture, even in this case, because it is known to be false, uh, because it is known to be too weak a condition uh, in general. Okay, but now I want to talk about uh, moduli spaces. In fact, this failure here, um, of the of this condition in general is also something which one can it's easiest to see if one talks about moduli spaces. Um, no, in fact, the case of curves is I mean you can do line bundles on curves, <laughs> but uh, curves is already some of the key.
case we don't understand. I mean, if I can prove this, or if anyone can prove this uh, statement, like this open question for curves, then I'm already very happy. <laughs> Uh, any more questions when I clean the boards here? I mean, Yes, I mean, we're not asking that uh, the subsheaf is necessarily in the image of the correspondent. I mean, it can have, can have strictly smaller. Ah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I have to think about this uh, afterwards. I don't know. I mean, these these questions about the essential image are really um, are, re are really subtle. Um, also, the <laughs> construction of uh, counterexamples to uh, to the same stability. Okay, but um, so in order to prepare this uh, about moduli spaces, I want to. explain what the, what the three key ideas or, or three key ideas uh, that go in the construction of this of this equivalence, this equivalence S. Mm, and somehow, okay, so the, the first, so how does this, how does this look like to give you some flavor of, of how this is constructed? So, so let's take a Higgs bundle. And that uh, B not denote uh, the image of theta, but written in this somehow slightly, <laughs> to me, preferable way of uh, amorphism of algebras. So B should be here. Uh, and in fact, um, it doesn't have to be the image. I can take any uh, coherent quotient of this uh, symmetric algebra here. And let's define B to be the pullback of the sheaf to the B topology. And so it's actually quite simple to say what this functor looks like. Namely, the idea is to find a certain invertible B module. So in the V topology in particular, let's call this uh, lambda and uh, I put a theta here because, I mean, B depends on theta. And then under this correspondence, this Higgs bundle should simply go to the twist of the underlying bundle by this invertible module. Okay, so somehow at the heart of this construction of this functor lies a twisting uh, construction. Mm, and how do we get this module here, so this is the first occurrence of moduli spaces. So very briefly, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this gives a first idea of where the exponential comes in. So to, to define this invertible module, one constructs the moduli space, let's call it G of invertible B modules. I don't want to say uh, get into too yeah to, into more technical details, but the idea is that whatever category I work with, work with, and we work in the prototype topology, this will be representable by a rigid group. And then the point, so the way that the exponential comes in is this is perhaps slightly surprising, but Whenever I choose such an exponential, even though this is a very artificial datum somehow, it uh, induces an exponential for any rigid group, which is like a Lie algebra exponential, namely an exponential from the Lie algebra of G, so this rigid group here, into the C points of G, somehow in the functorial 
way. Somehow, if I give an exponential of for GM, then I, I get an exponential for any rigid group satisfying some properties that needs to be locally p divisible terms and conditions apply, doesn't matter. So I get an exponential for this group here, okay? And the way that the invertible module will be cooked up is that I uh, have some canonical class in here, which I basically get from Hodge theory, if I think about it, and I will take its exponential. And then this, because this is a moduli space of invertible B modules, will be the moduli twist twist, okay? And one reason why I write this down is to explain where the exponential comes from, but also this gives some idea of what some of the, 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 the key cons construction at the heart of this correspondence is one of abelianization. So this is something um, like an idea which originates in, in, in complex non-abelian Hodge theory, where the idea is that you have somehow a torso under a non-abelian group, in this case a V-vector bundle, and you reduce it, the, like this, the study of this object, to um, a, a torso under some commutative, some abelian group. Yeah, in this case, this invertible B module. So one reduces non-abelian Hodge theory to relative abelian Hodge theory, roughly speaking. That's, that's what's happening here. So abelianization is somehow the key uh, idea here. And then, so lastly, um, so this uh, explains how to go in one direction. How do I go in the other direction? So if I start with a V-vector bundle, then, so let me just quote this as, as a fact. So this is a construction due to Louis Pan and uh, Juan Rodriguez Camargo. So there's actually a way to endow this V-vector this, this v bundle V with a canonical Higgs field. Okay, and, and unfortunately the board ends here, so I can't give you the unique characterization of this Higgs field, okay, but it's just a thing I can do, okay? It satisfies some nice properties. It's an analog of the P curvature. For example, the V-vector bundle is etal or analytic if and only if uh, this thing here vanishes, okay? But what it does by virtue of being a Higgs field is Whenever I have such a morphism, I can link, like dualize it to this morphism here, okay? And then I can show that the image of this morphism is again a coherent algebra. And now I can play the same game in reverse. Like I take this, this bundle here and I just uh, somehow tensor it over B with the inverse of uh, this invertible B module. Okay, so this is the construction in the other direction. So that's, that's, that's another key ingredient that one has this canonical Higgs field on the V-vector bundle. Okay, and with all these ideas on the board, we can finally do moduli spaces. Now actually. <coughs> but I want to point out again that already in the proof of this correspondence, moduli spaces played uh, a crucial role. I mean, these moduli spaces of invertible B modules. And in particular, already in this context, they somehow explain uh, why there is this exponential. Okay, moduli spaces. Mm, right, so the goal is to upgrade this uh, correspondence here to uh, a geometric comparison of moduli spaces. So we want to do geometric V bundleology. Mm. And I want to simplify the setup a bit. So this should work more generally, perhaps. But uh, let's think about, so as I said, in the case of smooth projective curves, it's already somehow the key case, perhaps, to understand. And uh, okay, so this will now be about joint work with, oops, Dashi and you. Okay, so without further ado, let's just define what these moduli stacks will be. So they will be V stacks, so defined the test objects will be perfectoid spaces. Over C. Okay, and we define functors fiber and groupoids. Let me just call them pre stacks. of this form, and one will be called bun V, 
for my n, and the other will be called Higgs n. So a modulized stack of v vector bundles and modulized stack of Higgs bundles. And we just send s to the groupoid of v vector bundles over x times s. And then we get very confident that we can just do the same here and write Higgs bundles on xs. And then we get confused because what's the Higgs bundle on xs? Because there's some notion of differential. And okay, there's a conceptual way to uh, explain what it is. And there's uh, a quick way. And I will do the quick way. So this is uh, in the tal vector bundle uh, E on xs. And the differential that I use is just some of the differential that I get via pullback from S1. Another way to say this is the relative differential of this of this morphism here. Okay, and then there's no Higgs field condition since I'm in the case of curves. Okay, and <clears throat> so the goal is now to compare these two objects. But okay, before I can compare them, so, so far these were just pre stacks, and it's clear actually that somewhat tautological that this this guy here is a is a v stack. But if you think about it, for this guy, it's not at all clear. Because what we need to prove here is that we have V descent for these objects, even though the bundle I have here is an etal one. And as we learn from uh, the periodic Simpson correspondence, uh, these are really two different things, okay? But it turns out that since we only need V descent in this perfectoid direction, uh, this is actually okay. Namely, both of these things turn out to be v-stacks. And in fact, they are nice v-stacks, namely they are small. Okay, doesn't matter so much what this means technically, we can just somehow do geometry with them. And next thing I want to point out that both of these stacks, so let's actually do some geometry. Let's write down some morphisms of stacks that we maybe know from the classical theory. Namely, in the classical theory of Higgs bundles, maybe on a complex curve, there's this thing, this morphism called the Hitchin vibration, which is very important in some more, uh, understanding the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And this is essentially an algebraic definition. And for this reason, it works in exactly the same way also in this setup here. Namely, there's this thing called the Hitchin base. And uh, I want to write it like this. So this is, in our case now, so this is just some uh, finite dimensional C vector space, and I want to consider it as an affine space, okay? And then I go from to end. So this is really just some affine rigid group. And this is defined by sending The Higgs field to its characteristic polynomial. And maybe one quick way to say what one means by this is that uh, I interpret now, so <laughs> theta has many <laughs> faces, and this time I want to maybe linearize it like this. And then, so this is now over this ring, and if I now, so then in particular, it is somehow in degree one, and if I compute its characteristic polynomial, I acquire these. Uh, these degrees here. So in, so in other words, I really want to think of this, this AN thing as being uh, a moduli space of characteristic polynomials. Okay. So it's a construction maybe originally due to Hitchin. And now the fun part is, and this is really surprising from the point of view uh, of complex geometry is that I can do the exact same thing on the other side, on the Betty side for v-vector bundles. Namely, as we just learned somewhere down there on that board, there's also a canonical Higgs field in any v-vector bundle. So why don't I just take this and send v to the characteristic polynomial of its associated uh, Higgs field. Okay, there's another way to make sense of this. I can invoke the local correspondence and somehow uh, yeah, construct this thing locally, but that's also a valid way of doing this. Okay, and 
This is again the morphism of these stacks. And okay, so I can now phrase the first slightly imprecise version of our main theorem, but this already gives you an idea of what's going on. Namely, what we want to prove is that this guy here is an etal twist of the classical Hitchin vibration uh, relatively over the Hitchin base. Okay, so in particular, etal locally on the Hitchin base, these two stacks are actually equivalent. Okay, and what I want to do in the last five minutes is make the statement a bit more precise in a way that one can perhaps also see what the exponential is doing. Okay? And maybe I should also say that, so at least in the case of curves, this guy, one can show that this really comes like by a diamondification from the algebraic stack of fixed bundles. So this here is really just a diamondine or, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, some, somehow perfectoid incarnation uh, of the classical Hitchin morphism. It's somehow the same object. And, uh, right, this thing is somehow mysterious. Okay. Mm. So let me go here. So how does this work? So the idea is to somehow geometrize these constructions of twisting with these modules here. And in the case of curves, there's a nice uh, way to somehow organize all these uh, coherent algebras B via the spectral curve. Okay, so this is some finite flat kappa of x times the Hitchin base, and in particular, this is, uh, it's a curve relatively over the Hitchin base. And, okay, so it's defined as the relative spec of uh, what I get if I quotient out by this algebra, which is always acting on, on the Higgs bundle by somehow the universal characteristic polynomial. Uh, right, and maybe I'm taking some relative spec in some <laughs> analytic sense, but so th the point being that um, I think of this thing as a moduli space of characteristic polynomials, and I want to think of this guy somehow as being, uh, somehow this parameterizes, the, the functions on this spec spectral curve parameterize uh, the algebras B uh, that are used in the construction uh, of S, okay? Because somehow <coughs> by Cayley Hamilton, if I have a Higgs bundle, then the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs bundle will act trivially. So I get an action of this, of this algebra here. Okay, and <coughs> as a consequence, mm -hmm. What I can do now is I can convince myself that all these constructions which happened on these boards here still work in perfectoid families. And I can incorporate them Pardon? Yes, so X is a curve uh, since, uh, since there. <laughs> yes, it's a relative curve over AN. Otherwise, I would have to call this a spectral variety. Uh, okay, so there's, there's natural actions of some of the Picard groupoid. So this is now, before I talked about invertible B modules, okay? And now since I sort of geometrized the situation uh, and B is this, this algebra OZ, these are now line bundles uh, on the spectral curve. And okay. Let me denote this by P. And this acts uh, on the moduli stack of fixed bundles. So this is uh, achieved relatively over the Hitchin base, okay, relative group stack or something. Okay, so in this sense, it acts on the Hitchin vibration. And then there's some classical theory which says that uh, uh, generically over the space, if the genus is large enough, uh, this is even uh, a torsor and even a split torso under this thing. And using somehow a, a version of the theory of the canonical Higgs field in families, 
one can see that, in fact, this group also acts on this twisted Hitchin vibration. Okay, and now I can formulate uh, the main theorem and with this be done. Mm, I need a board. Namely, okay, so this is a theorem from uh, maybe one month ago. And it says, so there's a canonical, and I really want to emphasize the word canonical because before things were non-canonical, p-torsor, let's call it L, and the canonical isomorphism or equivalence between the stack of V bundles of rank N and the stack of Higgs bundles twisted by this torsor. Okay, so this is now a completely canonical and also natural formulation in some sense of the, uh, the relation between V vector bundles and Higgs bundles. And how can I derive uh, the periodic Simpson correspondence from this? And it's a second path which says that choices, the, the usual choices lead to somehow something like a trivialization of this torso, namely choice of split, uh, of, of a lift and of an exponential induced the splitting on C points, not geometrically, just on points. Which I can use to somehow upgrade this to uh, in equivalence, and in particular, I get something on top. Namely, I can now get the analog of the final statement uh, in the complex theory, which I wrote down. Namely, we now get a homeomorphism between the C points of the moduli spaces. Okay, and this is now a statement of the periodic Simpson correspondence for curves that I'm uh, really happy with because we can now explain these choices somehow in a geometric fashion as being related to the trivialization of this of this torso uh, over here. Okay, but I, I should stop. Thank you very much. Right. <clears throat> so, I mean, I guess there's, so there's a way to use this, uh, this, this gerb. So, okay, to the people who were not in New York, uh, Bhagav Bhatt and Meng Zhang have this gerb and it's called the Simpson gerb. And it is um, somehow supposed to explain, uh, for example, the, the periodic Simpson correspondence um, in a way that uh, these choices that one makes there um, induce splittings of the gerb over some uh, subspace maybe. <clears throat> And so this is going in a slightly different direction because once again, somehow uh, I can now probably make sense of the statement that this guy here is something like a stack of splittings of the Simpson gerb over some locus. So once again, I can use the Simpson gerb to, to understand what this guy here, uh, what, what, this, what, what this guy looks like. And... Uh, But this is a torso, ah. Uh, ah, right, okay, right. So by, by embedding, somehow seeing the spectral curve as, okay, so I pull everything uh, over the Hitchin base. Ah, nice, okay, that makes sense, cool, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the way I think of this, the, the, the Simpson gerb is really that uh, it is this one object that organizes everything, <laughs> like uh, all these various instances, like, like for example, this, uh, this one over here. Yes, one can interpret in terms of the Simpson gerb. Like for example, so I said also something about, um, the local correspondences, right, which are somehow related to, in terms of the Simpson gerb, they give a splitting of the Simpson gerb over somehow some open subset, perhaps, of uh, the cotangent space. And uh, I mean, I guess that's one way of seeing, I mean, there are other ways, 
that this guy here is split over some open subdisk of this guy. So in particular, I can recover the small correspondence in this case in terms of moduli spaces and actual equivalence of moduli spaces because over this locus, I have a splitting, uh, a canonical one of, of this uh, Trotter. Yes, I wonder as well. <laughs> so uh, yes, I think that's that's an interesting uh, direction to look into. I don't know. I mean, I think in, in the case of rank one, I maybe understand what, roughly what's going on. And once again, there's maybe some analog of uh, this twister structure, <laughs> where one can somehow see uh, the moduli space of Higgs bundles as like a degeneration of uh, the space of V bundles. but. Uh, I'm not sure how this works in, in high. I mean, <laughs> this is one month old. <laughs> so. uh, in the middle board, when you, when, um, where the two things you wrote down and, and uh, you know, compared the error of two steps, mm -hmm. at that point, you had already assumed the edge of the curve. But is that property yes. still relevant? Yes, yes. So uh, did I erase it? I erased it. So this theorem, I, uh, I, I quoted, this actually works for any. In fact, it doesn't even use the properness. This, this you can do for any rigid, smooth rigid space. Also over a perfectoid base rather than over something algebraically closed. Whereas for these things, it's really important that we work in an algebraically closed situation. Yes. But somehow the fact that this is a VSEC is a local statement, so to say, not a global one. Yes. To, to what? To a true local system? Oh, yes. Uh, maybe. <clears throat> so. So I think, like, if I understand correctly, Bhargav is asking now, what about representations? Yeah, H how do these fit into the picture? And uh, they do fit into the picture. So let me erase this problem. Namely, <coughs> so there's something like a, a stack of representations as well, and it, it fits here, uh, representations of rank n. And uh, we prove in this article that this is, in fact, an open substack of, of this stack here. Um, and so this should correspond to some, some open substack here, okay? But uh, this, is, this is very um, instructive to, to see this failure of this condition of semi-stable differentiating churn classes describing the correct, uh, the, the correct subspace because if we do this story uh, in rank one, then what we see is that somehow roughly, so, so this guy will be a torso uh, under some Picard variety. Maybe let's fix the degree that, that it becomes a torso under some pick zero, whereas this guy here will correspond to the topological torsion part, which is roughly the p-divisible group plus all um, torsion points. So in particular, like this looks like an abelian variety, whereas this looks like an infinite union of disks. And the weird thing is that over CP, the points of as rigid spaces match up, but the geometric structures don't match up at all, which is somehow showing that this condition, this semi, the, the, the vanishing churn classes, which in this case correspond to this pick zero here, right? The degree being zero. And the fact that we see geometrically here that there's this discrepancy tells us that, uh, yeah, this is really, uh, that's, yeah, this is really not the correct condition in general. And to answer the question in, in general, I would expect that one can formulate uh, a reduction of structure group to this morphism of the relative, of, of the uh, topological torsion of the relative Picard variety. I mean, I should write this one. And I would expect that this is the guy that gives the representation, but that, that's a wild guess. Yes, sorry. So, <clears throat> sorry. So, so um, I believe that this stack here. Ah, sorry, you can't see it from. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I believe that the stack of representations <laughs> might be. Maybe I should rather formulate this as a question. So, this guy here uh, is somehow uh, a torso under this, this uh, thing, at least, let's say, generically over the Hitchin base, okay? Let's work over the regular locus, and this guy's actually a torso. And then I would believe that this guy's a canonical reduction of structure group to the topological torsion part of this. Yes. Yes. So actually, after taking into account this guy, there's even a reduction of structure group to P infinity, and now one just needs to form the push out. So this gives really a canonical um, candidate for what this should be. Other questions? Oh, so we, we have 